start in about 15 seconds. Annie, how are we doing? All ready to go? Let's begin. So, last time we were talking about MCMC, and I said a lot of stuff, and I said it really quickly. And so we need to slow way down and go through all these terms and understand it a lot better. Saying that, when I get confused on how to teach you something, I usually just say everything, and then I say it again with examples. And so, and that's when you cling on. And then I give you a homework assignment and have you implement it. So you're gonna be doing all of this on your next homework. We're a little ahead of the game, so I still haven't posted the homework. I haven't told you enough on how to do it. So a couple more days until I hand that out to you. So let's just remind you what we did last time. So we wrote down this algorithm. So there's really two steps in this algorithm. We propose something and then we decide to make the move. So here's the idea of the algorithm. It's just this wandering sort of algorithm. I throw something out stochastically. That's what G represents. So that's some proposal distribution. I'll give you an example in a moment. But basically, let's just imagine I'm in some part of the search space. So I'm in theta space. So theta in my example could be any random variable. High dimensional, continuous, continuous and discrete. Could be a tree, it could be anything. Okay, something that you want to put a random measure on. So this algorithm is pretty general, right here. And so I want to sample from that thing. So the goal is to sample from F theta. I changed it from pi theta because I'm using pi's to denote stationary distributions. And it so happens that our stationary distribution that we want to sample from is our posterior. And so, but I want to distinguish those two terms. So I've moved my posterior being F. And so imagine F is over here. So imagine contours of F, high mass stuff over in this location. And he's walking right through F. <laughs> so there's this high mass thing. And let's say I start over here and kind of this low mass region. This is my initialization, step zero. What I'm gonna do is I, maybe I'm gonna draw a circle around me, something like that. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna to propose to go somewhere in this circle. Okay, so let's say I propose to go here, right here. Now I need to make a decision as to whether or not I wanna go there. And so I'm just gonna flip a coin according to this acceptance probability. And so maybe I make that move or maybe I back it up. So it's just an exploratory process. I make the move if it looks good to me according to this rule. So let's just think about what this rule says. This part, this is again our sampling density. We can write it down. We can at least write it down up to proportionality. So the example that we've been studying is maybe this is a joint normal distribution. And so maybe I can write down F up to proportionality and I can plug it right into this thing. And I can evaluate it in different places. So in our normal example, theta is just representing mu and our precision parameter. Okay, so that's my two-dimensional space. And this ratio says that if the density is higher for my proposed location compared to where I previously was, go there, is what it's saying. If this number is big, then the probability of moving there is high. Okay. But we have to be careful, is what this part says. So this is the inverse ratio of proposals. And so what it's saying is, if it's hard to propose where I'm coming from, given where I'm proposing to move to, if this is small compared to where I'm moving to, then maybe don't make the move. So let me just say that again. If this is big relative to where we were last time in our target, maybe you make the move, but be careful. Make sure that you're allowed to move back to the old location. So I can, if I did make the move, what's the probability of me proposing backwards? So if that's small, don't make the move. So this is what it says. It says be careful with your choices, make sure you're welcome back. So this is kind of a principle that we live our lives by. I make decisions all the time on what to do, how to update my state in life. My state in life is what I'm doing currently at that moment. And so people say don't burn bridges. So when I hear that, I think Metropolis hastens. So what it says is, make moves if they increase your utility, but make sure you're welcome to go back to the old location. So I kind of think about 
What would maximize my utility? What is like the thing that I always dream about doing in my life? Anybody have any guesses? What would I like to do? Any? Drive around the country on a motorcycle. Yeah, I mean, that, so I, I do do that, but I always, I, I watch on Sundays motorcycle racing and I think, man, I got it. I got what it takes to do this. And so maybe I go up to my department head and I say, hey, Dave, you know, I got this great idea. You know, I want to go race motorcycles for the next year. And so what he's going to tell me is he'd say, okay, maybe go do that, but you're not welcome back anymore. And so I choose not to do those sort of things. And then I just ride around the country. And so it really is, I would terminate my career if I made a move like that. So it's not sensible to make that move. That's all this is saying. And so this I always call the ratio of proposals. And this is the, in, or sorry, this is the ratio of target. And this is the inverse ratio of proposal. Okay, so let's just go back to, I'm in some position in space. I draw a circle around me, maybe my proposal is circular. I decide to make a move. Then I compare F at this location compared back to this other location. And if it's higher, maybe I'm inclined to make a move, but I have to account for my proposal. Eventually, this algorithm is going to wander around. And I'm going to start making moves. Sometimes I stay, I back up, I make moves. And then eventually, I find myself over here where F is high mass. And then once I get over here, I just start walking around. So, and I never leave the high mass area. I'll drift down the tails, but I'll back back up to the, the high mass stuff. And what ends up happening is the samples that we get, those are all my footsteps around the room. That's this collection right here. And I denoted this with a B for burn in, that as I'm drifting across the room, and I'm saying, whoa, I'm starting to find something, I'm really walking up the tails of the distribution. And then once I get there into the high mass stuff, I don't want to move anymore. And so, as I was marching over, I want to get rid of that stuff. That was my algorithm trying to find where the high mass solution is. And so I want to chop all that earlier stuff off and throw it away. And then these samples represent my footsteps through the high mass area. And so, and if I want to know the probability for a particular area, I look at the frequency in which I've stepped around that area. So does that make sense? So what I mean is these samples, will have relative frequency proportional to I'll write down whatever our target distribution is. I'm writing it down as F theta. And then maybe I want to integrate over some region. And I'm just going to call this uh, region. So the frequency, of the, the frequency of the samples that I get in this region are going to approximate this integral right here. So this is the area under that curve. That's the probability of being in that area. So that's kind of cool. That's a totally frequentist thing. And so all these algos, these iterative algorithms, they're frequentist. And they're governed by all those frequentist statistics that you learned about. So asymptotic frequency I get, relative frequency I get, and I love this stuff. However, this is a Bayesian class. It's a little different than going out and getting data. What we're really doing when we go to a, a sampling distribution is we're imagining we're going out and plucking data out of it. And so in frequentist statistics, they'll take whatever your sample is, and they might envision you know, its relative frequency compared to other things that happen. They'll come up with probability estimates based off of that. And so what's a little bit different from the data <laughs> setting is I actually get to control my sample size. So that's something I have control over. So I do like all that frequentist math, that relative frequentist stuff, especially when I can control the asymptotics. So i.e. I can control n, and in our case, it's just the iteration counter in our for loop. How many times I go in and I sample for the thing. So I've been proven that this works and those samples do eventually come, but we've at least looked at an example of that happening. And so again, just one more time, let's look at an example. See what's going on. I'm reluctant to show you my code 
because I think it'll confuse you right now, and I am going to have you write it, but I'll walk you through it very soon. I need to tell you about gift sampling first. So there's a number of things that I've done to this example to at least illustrate what I want to illustrate, i.e., there's a burn-in rate. When you actually go to do this in homework, it's going to burn in in two steps. data points. I've got true sigma, true mu, and I'll just generate this. And to remind you, I think we picked true sigma was 5, and true mu was 42. So the same numbers from last time. And I just got a whole other set of data. So this would be somebody came in with 101 data points, and I want to learn these joint parameters. And then I run my algorithm. What I'm really doing is I'm just running this, and I'm going to outline what this at least maybe looks like. It's a little deviation from what I actually implemented, but let me walk through the example and show you what I might code up. So I run this thing, I have some starting location, it was over here, and it converged relatively quickly. So it turns out that's one over five squared. So that's the precision parameter right here, is this thing, and this is 42. And that's my posterior distribution. These are all my samples that I get from everything. Once I chopped off the burn-in, here's my samples. And so I can plot the marginal distributions of everything, and that's what I've done here, is I ended up just marginally looking at the mutes. So in this two-dimensional <coughs> plot of the trajectories of my samples, I've just taken one dimension and I've plotted it here. Then I took the other dimension and I plotted, plotted it. Okay, so I didn't plot them jointly. And so it turns out if I didn't know how to do an integration, these distributions that I'm getting are the marginal distributions. And that's pretty cool. So can somebody please tell me what is this distribution mathematically? I'm pretending I don't know and I've just run a sampler to do everything, but we do know the answer. What's that? It's not a binomial. So again, phi right here. So remember the first test. Think about what space you live in. So where does phi live? Zero to infinity. Test fake. So not a binomial. Binomials live between zero and n. They're discrete. Yeah. So you guys are, are both right. So it turns out it's some scale pi squared. It's a gamma distribution. We've worked this out. So this is just that marginal distribution. So f phi given x, how did we do it? We integrated between negative infinity and infinity f phi mu given x. And I integrate out mu. And so I believe we've touched this several times now, that integral. How do we do it? We complete the square or some analog of completing the square to do it. So it's a gamma. Which gamma is it? You probably know the answers. It has something to do with some n minus ones, right? What's the axis of the upper quad? What's that? What's the axis? It's just my iterations. So those are the number of iterations. I know it looks a little messy when I end up blowing this stuff up on the, the projector. It usually takes my fonts and makes them really big, but I prefer big fonts than small. So it's just the number of iterations. So I'm just counting, like just looking at the trajectory of all of those feeds that I got out of my give sample. And so same thing over here. And we'll notice that these are nice and smooth right here. If I go and I look in the first part right here, I'll notice that there's some burn in. So this thing burned in for a while. And then once it got to this location, it stayed there. That's the stationary distribution. It looks like a nice fuzzy caterpillar. Okay. So, and that's good. I'm going to tell you what bad looks like later. Here's one version of bad. This thing that doesn't look like it's converged, and that's burning. I'm going to play around with this, and I'm going to give you other diagnostics. It turns out we're not always so lucky, and we get nice fuzzy caterpillars and this nice sort of convergence. So sometimes we have to do a little bit more. 
And so same thing over here. When I look, I can zoom into that, and I can see this kind of nice shape right there. So I have done some interesting things in my code, but without those details, if I zoom in really close right here, I'll notice that there's plateaus in there. Those are my rejections when I didn't accept. So this isn't an accept reject algorithm where I throw everything away. So there are some algorithms that look like that where if you don't accept the sample, you toss it. This one you score. <coughs> what it's saying is that's a high probability location and don't move so quickly. It's probably what it's saying. And so we'll talk about all these diagnostics later. And I can control these, what this shape is going to look like in my code. Once we understand Metropolis and Gibbs, I'll walk you through the code and show you how to tune this thing. So here's my transition function. One, two. I think that's she means the algorithm. G. Yeah. What's that? I think she means G. Oh, G. My proposal function. <coughs> yeah. Great question. Let's start with that. So, but before we do it, what's what distribution is this marginal? Not. Remember what the margin looks like. I have to integrate over feet. How do you tell me about mu if you don't know the variance? T distribution. It's not one on one students. No to move from the Z table to the T table. And so if I didn't know that and I just invoked my sampler, it turns out this stuff is T with the correct degrees of freedom, and so on and so forth. And so I can learn about these things marginally, and I can also learn about them jointly. So this is really why nobody really cares that much about the joint association and mu and the variance or phi in my case. It's these things turn out to be circles real quickly. But early in small sample sizes, we noticed that this was a strong triangular shape. Not correlated, but certainly associated. And so independent contours, they don't have that sort of shape. They look like circles or ellipses that are axis and parallel. Okay, so now let's get to this. How do we actually code this thing up? We need a G. So let me simplify the example. And let's just do one of these parameters. Okay. See what this looks like. <coughs> what I told you last time and I'm going to walk through this a little bit more, because this was fast, is what we're actually converging to is the limiting distribution. So what I'm doing is I'm taking theta out, I plug it into the transition, I regenerate a new thing, and I plug it back in, and I generate a new thing. And I keep going through this. Thetas converge to their stationary distribution when you do this. And so what is this equation? So that's the limiting distribution, sorry. That's the limiting distribution if it exists. So if I just keep clicking through it. I'll show you a discrete example in a moment. The stationary distribution for a Markov chain always exists, and you find it by solving this equation. If this exists right here, this limit, it turns out it is the stationary distribution. So when limits do exist, the limiting distribution turns out they're stationary. Basically, what we need for a limiting distribution to exist, remember, we're clicking through this in a limiting sense. I'm just walking through and updating the parameter. So really all I'm doing is just walking through this transition right here. Um, is we need things to happen with no funny patterns. So maybe I can only get back to a particular data on even draws or something like that. I don't like that. Some sort of systematic weirdness. So if I can only get back to a particular value of mu on even draws or odd draws, that would be, a, that would be weird. So we don't want things like that to happen. So we also need to be able to move from anywhere in the space to anywhere else in the space eventually, and we need to be able to come back to where we started from. Those are the three conditions. So what it basically says is I can get around the space and I do it without funny determined patterns. Turns out that's going to be enough to guarantee that a limiting distribution exists and it's our stationary target. So there's a couple things going on again. We want to find a stationary distribution. We know what stationary distribution we sample from. I'm going to march through a Markov chain to do that. It eventually limits to the right thing. If that's too much, 
I'll do a discrete example in a moment with them. Mark off chains. Let's just do a, a quick example, try to answer this question of what's G? That's the whole question in MCMC land. What's G? So I want to just point out before we begin doing this, so we'll write this down. What's G? Great question. This will determine what algorithm you're actually running. But MCMC stands for Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Somebody answer real quickly. What is Monte Carlo? I think I've asked you that question before. This is Monte Carlo. Sampling process? Yeah, some sort of sampling thing, right? So there's actually properties to Markov chain or Monte Carlo algorithms. It gives you an approximate answer in a finite amount of time. So it has that property. So I fix P and it's going to execute minus gamma radiation that seems to change things in my computer. It doesn't run at exactly the same time, but theoretically it should. And so I click through everything, finite amount of time, and my answer is approximately good. The longer I run it, the better my algorithm is. So there are random running time algorithms, and those are called Las Vegas algorithms. We usually don't like them, because it's a really tacky response to tell somebody, I don't know how long my code's gonna run. It's totally random. It, it took 10 minutes yesterday, but it might take five hours today. So, and we don't know. That's not great. So I'll talk a little bit about those algorithms later on. But what's G? So I will point out all MCMC algorithms differ by how we choose G. So let's do a simpler example. So imagine I didn't know how to sample normal random numbers. And maybe you do not know how to sample random numbers, normal random numbers. So let me just ask this question. How do you sample? from a normal distribution. Anybody know the answer? And ran in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is the answer, right? You push the button on your computer. What is your computer doing? Inverse CDF is an interesting answer. So inverse CDF is a neat algorithm that if I take the CDF of some distribution, and I invert that CDF over a uniform, it produces a random draw from that distribution. It's just transformation of variables. And so it's a neat technique. You can't do it here. It's impossible to apply. Do you know why? Because you can't write down the CDF in closed form. So you're not going to be able to invert it here. So that's too bad. What's that? Your closed box Mueller is the algorithm. And so it's this transformation that takes into account logs and sines and cosines. What it gives you for two uniform random numbers, it gives you two normals. So you get two for the price of two in that algorithm. And it's just a transformation of variables. It's pretty neat. Um, so we would never actually run Metropolis Hastings on this. But let's imagine I didn't know about that algorithm and I just wanted this general algorithm. It'll work, it'll just run slower than Box Mueller. So Box Mueller for two uniforms, I get two normals, and they're distributed according to whatever normal I've inverted on, or whatever normal that I've, I've specified. Um, in Metropolis Hastings, I eventually get norms, so I have to wait for a while. So it'd be better to do this Box Mueller thing than what I'm doing, but let's just imagine I didn't know about Box Mueller. So let's say I get X's from a normal distribution, I'll make it real simple and I'll say sigma squared is known. Just for the time being. So i goes from one to n. So I've got my data set and I want to sample from pi b. And I have no idea what that distribution is. So here's our goal. Sample from pi mu, and just to be really specific, I'm going to write down given sigma squared. Okay, maybe I don't recognize this distribution. 
Okay, so we're playing a mental game right here. Of course we know this thing is normal. You even know what normal it is. But say I didn't know anything about normals. I didn't know Vox Mueller. I could invoke Metropolis Hastings. And that's why it's popular. You can always run to it. And so it's always a question of just speeding it up. So here's what Metropolis Hastings would look like. Metropolis Hastings would be initialized. So step zero, I'm going to take mu zero. And I'm going to say it's equal to some value. Now I'm going to just write down my two steps and we'll talk about what g could be. So t goes from 1 to some large number. How large is large? The quick answer I'll give you right now is until your samples start to get distributed according to the stationary distribution. How do we see that? We see it by that fuzzy caterpillar shift in our plot. So once it becomes fuzzy caterpillar, so, and then however many samples I need from that. We'll be more formal later. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to propose. So propose. I'll say mu is going to be sample mu star is going to come from some proposal. And I will answer the question in a second. Mu t minus 1. And then I'm going to decide. So alpha is going to be the minimum. Let's say I was just really foolish and I, I didn't even know how to simplify any of this stuff. So 1, I could write down my likelihood. I could do this. I goes from 1 to n. And then I'm just going to write down e to the minus 1 half xi minus mu squared. And I'll write it in terms of sigma squared. So there's my likelihood. It's really my likelihood times prior because I'm going to use flat prior. So let's just write down pi mu right here as proportional to 1. So you have to make your choice up front. So here's likelihood. minus, and I'll put in mu star right here. So this thing right here is mu star that I'm plugging in. And then I've got mu xi's minus mu t minus 1 squared divided by sigma squared. And then I need whatever this proposal is. G mu star given mu t minus 1 g mu t minus 1, given mu star. And then I accept accordingly. So I'm going to flip a coin with this probability after I compute it, and then I'm going to decide whether I make a move or not. So in this coding, why should we use log likelihoods instead of likelihoods? Or it's not likelihoods? I will talk about all of this. So Christina's staring at this and saying, good luck on a computer. Mathematically, I'm good. Christina knows this won't fail. But at least in theory, it's right. So let's talk about all those issues. So um, after this, I'm just going to update mu t according to my rule. So it's either going to be mu star or where it was last time. And this is going to happen with probability alpha. This happens otherwise. So alpha is changing at every step of this algorithm. So I'm always just flipping these points. Okay. So let's come up with a G. What do you guys think? You get to pick that. So this is always the part that we're all figuring out which G should I use. Some G's work better than others. But how might we choose First thing, I have to say G samples from the right space. So if I only sample positive values out of G, I'd miss all the negative stuff. And so G has to have the same support as our target. So I'll say one thing, G mu T minus 1 must 
have the same support. That's our target. How would you do it? How would I propose something between negative infinity and infinity? Dan, what would you do? Normal. Normal, yeah. So that's where my example gets really flaky <laughs> because I'm saying I don't know how to sample from a normal, right? And so, but what I'm really saying is let's say I didn't do the math and I didn't recognize that as a normal. Still got this button on my computer, maybe I'll just push, push it a bunch of times. And so Dan says maybe I'll use a normal. And so just to follow this example and not make it seem too silly, let's pretend we didn't know that was normal. So we couldn't do any math, we just wrote it down, but I've got this button that generates random numbers. If I didn't know that this was a normal right here, my target, and I knew which normal it is, I would just invoke my normal sampler on that. And in fact, I'd probably just be analyzing which normal it is, because I know so many things about normals. So, but maybe a normal. Silly enough. So this is why you would never do this, but at least is illustrative. Silly enough. Maybe choose a normal. Let's say we didn't know that this was a normal. How would we base our choice? Yeah, so what this said, I would first look at the support of where I wanted to sample. If I knew it was symmetric, then maybe I want some sort of symmetric sampling around where I was last time. And so I can't just answer the question arbitrarily for you. If I knew the answer to that, here's the G you choose, no matter what your problem is. I'd have a Nobel Prize. So I think it would be that dramatic. So we don't usually know until we set up the problem. And so I'm going to say G mu, given mu t minus 1, is equal to a normal. Dan, where would you set it? Um, at 0. Maybe it's zero. <laughs> so maybe I want to exploit my last answer. And so what I might do is I could take this to be zero, and that would be called an independent proposal. It doesn't have anything to do with what you looked at last time, but maybe I could center this you know, where I was last time. And then maybe I could pick some variance right there. So this is where we were last time. This proposal is the, you know, where have you been lately proposal. So it's called a local proposal. So you're kind of exploiting where you were last time. This thing right here is too normal. So let's just go back to when I was walking around the floor. So when I said I was going to search in a circle, that's essentially what this is doing in one dimension. I'm just searching to the left or the right. I never discussed how big is my radius. And that obviously has something to do with the answer. If I made my radius really big, then I'd say, hey, I can jump really far away from myself. If I made it really tiny, then I'd just be tiptoeing really slowly through the space. And so this part is tunable, and it determines how fast you walk through that space. How daring are you willing to be? And so it depends on what the actual target looks like. If the target is really diffused, I probably need a more diffused proposal to search around it real quick and move around it. Saying that, this algorithm will work theoretically no matter what I pick right here. It's just going to determine how long it takes to do my sampling. So imagine in my example I wound up over an F and psi squared my tunable was really small. So I've got this big map so I want to search around and I'm just going to tippy toe around it. It's going to take me a long time to see what the whole space looks like. Okay? Or I could end up making the radius really big and I'm always jumping outside and rejecting it. And so this is kind of a Goldilocks phenomenon. So we don't want it too big and we won't want it too small. Okay? So look what happens right here. Can anybody identify this number when I use that proposal? It's one. So just note that g mu star given mu t minus 1 is going to be you know, 1 over root 2 pi 
psi e to the minus one half mu star minus mu t minus one squared over psi squared. So that would be in the denominator. And in the numerator right here, I just flip those two terms around. And it's exactly the same thing. So it's symmetric in those. So I'll write down this is symmetric. In theta star, or I'll say mu star, and mu t minus 1. And so this part actually just falls out of the equation. Now I would never code it up. So maybe I've got numerical issues right there. I raise something to the e. I've got some jump number in the numerator, some jump number in the denominator. Not to mention I have to do functional evaluations. And I already know theoretically if it's symmetric, that thing will be 1. So I just told you a new algorithm. So when Metropolis Hastings uses a symmetric distribution, symmetric proposal, and this is what it means to be symmetric. G theta star, I'll go back to theta, just to discuss this in general, is equal to G theta t minus 1. So I don't mean visually when I look at the distribution, it's symmetric. What I mean is that when I reverse the arguments, it's the same function. Okay, I'll show you an example that doesn't look symmetric to your eye, but is a symmetric proposal. Some people get confused about this. We call the algorithm. Metropolis Hastings, just Metropolis. So that's the technical difference. So I think it was in 54, I might be off by a year. Um, Metropolis came up with this algorithm and he had a symmetric proposal. Then three years later in 57, Hastings came in and said, what if you use a non-symmetric proposal? How does all this change? And so a lot of people will start off and tell you about Metropolis, and then they'll tell you about Metropolis Hastings. But really, it's easier to just talk about Metropolis Hastings first and then show what Metropolis does. So that's one such proposal. And the only thing you have to worry about is psi right here. Okay, let's go to the more complicated problem. Question. So, moving towards inferring f mu phi given x, so we want to do the joint analysis, what proposal would you use? So I need a proposal on mu and phi. Let me get in where we were last time. If Dan had picked zero right here and plugged it in, it wouldn't have been a symmetric proposal. So that cancellation wouldn't have happened. And my algorithm would work good in the vicinity towards zero be really efficient towards that over up by zero, but let's assume that the true mu is like the thousandth. So I'd always be proposing junk stuff way far on the tails, and it would take forever for this algorithm to work. And I really do mean it. In reality, it would take forever. It would never work. But what would you think for this? So I could say this is going to be equal to a normal on mu t minus 1 and some tunable, just like we did before, and I can multiply it by something else. So I'll be real specific. And I'll write down that we're sampling mu. So I'm going to sample mu out of that, and now I need a proposal for phi. What would you pick? What's that? 
gamma. And then I would ask the same question, how would you parameterize it? And you would be good at sampling if your target was in the mass region of your proposal. And so, similar answer to what Dan gave. So I'd have to parameterize it. What I might want is a proposal to adapt with me and kind of move, kind of walk. I do know that the margins of this, these things are unimodal. And so searching locally is kind of a good idea. You might be thinking, what do I do if it's multimodal? Searching locally is a bad idea. Talk about that later. That makes this problem harder. We need a better G. So what would you pick? So gamma, I would be, I'd say that's fine. Could work so long as you had knowledge on where to center that gamma and how to use to make it. Any other distributions you know about? How could I make that thing walk? I'm going to have you think about this. So I'll often, I'll say it quickly. A lot of people will take a truncated normal right here. So some people will do this. Phi given phi t minus 1. And then I might have some other tuning parameter. I'll write down psi phi right here. I'll call this one psi phi. So I might do that, but I have to make sure that it never goes negative. Otherwise, I'll tell you what happens, because I've done it. You throw a negative number into a, a normal distribution for its variance, and it's going to spout out nonsense. Your code's going to crash and go wandering off to weird stuff. It's no longer a distribution if you're trying to sample from it anymore. And so I might end up cutting down an indicator function that phi is greater than 0. So this is a truncated normal. A lot of people use this choice. Turns out this is not symmetric because the normalizing constant changes when you change the truncation level. Right? So a truncated normal just looks like this. So I might have V T minus 1 right here. And I'm just going to get rid of that part. So get rid of that stuff. Throw it away. When I move this thing around, the normalizing constant changes a little bit. So in your proposal ratio, you have to account for that. The kernel of the distribution is symmetric. It's just the normalizing constant part that's wrong. Turns out if you coded it up and you forgot about that normalizing constant, you'd barely be able to tell. And I'll show that to you later. Turns out that ratio of normalizing constants is usually pretty well behaved. So I, in the beginning of graduate school, thought that was a symmetric proposal, and I used it for a while, and I could never detect that I was making an error. Go through that with you guys later. So, but it's not symmetric. You could do another thing and try to work with the symmetric version of phi. I could transform phi and put it onto the log scale. I could talk about log phi, redefine a new parameter. So, and what would that end up doing if I looked at log phi? It would build it between negative infinity and infinity, and now I could use a symmetric proposal. I'll give you a paper to read on all of this, but you will be implementing this and making one of these choices later. Okay, I'm gonna show you what a GIF sampler is next time, but I wanna take the last six minutes and talk more about the theoretical underpinnings of this algorithm. And just talk about stationarity a little bit more and limiting distributions a little bit more. So let's just take it aside. come back to the algo and all the choices and how to invoke it. It's going to be a major part of this class. But let's just do some markup chain theory. So imagine I've got some markup chain. I'll say this is a 3 by 3. to the probability of 
moving from so this right here this is the probability of moving from the first state to the second state so that's what it is so this is the probability of moving from right state to shapes. All of these probabilities are sum to one. Otherwise, it's not a probability space. So this is the probability of staying in state one, moving to state two, or moving to state three. And so those things will sum up to one. So let me just ask you real quickly. This is, I'll say, the one step transition matrix. Question. What's the probability? So here's the idea. I could start in state one, I could move to state one, and then I could move to state one again. So in two steps. So I go to state one, from state one, and then I stay there after a second time. Or I could have gone from state one to state two, and then from state two to state one. So let's just write this down. This is probability of going from state one to state one twice in a row is that thing squared. So that's the probability that I go from state one to state one and then I do it again. Or I could end up going from state one to state two, then I go from state two to state one. And so that's what that looks like. Or I could go from state one to state three and then from state three to state one. So that's the probability. And if you can think of any other ways to do it, you would write it down. But that's, those are the ways to do it. So in general, what's the two state transition look like? Anybody answer this real quickly? A squared. A squared. That's what it is. So, well, this has got good linear algebra. It turns out A squared. So the first term in A squared would be that. Let me ask you a slightly different question. What's the end step? And this should have said step. End step transition matrix look like? What's this? That's what it looks like. I have one of these that I coded up right before class, and I want to show you something. those three conditions, we'll come back and we'll start with this next time, a little of this MC theory. If I ended up having the three conditions 
where limiting distribution exists, and we'll talk more about those, that if I ended up powering this thing up right here, so if I ended up taking the limit, is n goes to infinity, a n, what would happen if the limiting distribution existed is the probabilities that I see right here would be the same probability that I would see right here. Would be the same probability that I would see right here. I would see all these probabilities being the same. And I would see all these probabilities being the same as well. So it wouldn't matter where I started from, essentially. That's what a limiting distribution is in the discrete sense. And I'm basically taking my value out, starting at that new state, and then taking a transition again. So the exact same thing we did in continuous land is represented by a n as I take n to infinity. We'll come back next time with uh, functional MATLAB, and we'll look at a couple examples of that, and we'll see when a transition does not exist, or a uh, limiting distribution does not exist. I'll give you one example that you can go home and think about. Think about this transition matrix. One, one, zero, zero on the diagonal. This does not have a limiting distribution. So if you think about it, if I start in state one with the probability that I move in state one, I'm stuck. Same with state two. This is a Markov chain. It just traps you real quickly. There's no limiting distribution. If I end up powering that up again, it's still always the identity. You're stuck as soon as you get to that. We'll pick up next time with these examples, click through the computer, see what limiting distributions look like, and show you how to compute state security. Then we're going to apply all that theory to this algorithm and show that it's producing the correct stationary distribution. So that's going to be how we proceed. That's it right now, guys. Thanks so much.